On a bitterly cold August morning, Malcolm Douglas drives out from Alice Springs along the sealed road leading to one of Australia's most famous tourist attractions, Ayers Rock. Travellers marvel at this spectacular monolith, then return east. But Malcolm will head west from the rock following bush tracks all the way to the Indian Ocean, a rugged journey through some of Australia's most inhospitable and deserted lands. Along the way, he'll camp with the Pinterby, nomads from the great sandy desert. Accompanying Malcolm is Brendan Bell from Sydney. And Bonnie, Malcolm's red heeler pup. The road leading to the mysterious Olgas cuts deep into the plain. 30 kilometres away, the bizarre group of ancient eroded sandstone, regarded by many to be more awesome than Ayers Rock. The major peak, Mount Olga, towers 546 metres above the desert. That's 200 metres higher than the rock. Only the most adventurous go beyond the Olgas, for this is the beginning of the Gun Barrel Highway. There are no towns, the road deteriorates, and permits must be obtained before passing through Aboriginal lands. Near the Northern Territory West Australian border, one of our most sensational mysteries began. In this cave, the famous prospector, Harold Lassiter, sheltered for 28 days after his camels bolted. Attempting to walk 140 kilometres back to Mount Olga, he perished. Nearby, Malcolm inspects veins of quartz. Perhaps Lassiter, in his exhausted state, thought that he'd located deep deposits of gold here. And with the passing of time, the mystery of Lassiter's lost reef has become even more intriguing. Wherever water's found in the desert, budgerigars flock to drink. Landing for a few fleeting moments before instinctively wheeling in unison into the air. This nervous, erratic behaviour is provoked by the watchful falcons that prey on smaller birds. All wild budgerigars have the same bright green plumage. The variety of colours seen in domestic budgies throughout the world has been developed through selective breeding. Before moving on, Malcolm cooks up the last of his fresh meat. A shovel makes a handy barbecue plate. Malcolm leaves the gun barrel highway and heads north, following bush tracks to the border. Camps in the desert are basic, swags rolled out wherever there's a clearing in the spinifex. Every morning, Malcolm gets an exuberant wake-up call from Bonnie. A makeshift sign's the only indication that they're crossing a state border. A brilliant display of Sturt's Desert Pea demands a closer look. After rain, they grow in profusion throughout the arid regions of Australia. This is one of our most spectacular wildflowers. Another plant common in the desert is this particular acacia with its distinctive spindly seed pods. A handful rubbed vigorously with a splash of water lathers into an efficient soap. Of all the desert's strange and unique animals, the most bizarre is the thorny devil. Normally a slow plodder, it can run quickly from danger. Then its energy spent, it sits motionless. This ferocious looking creature is actually quite harmless, living exclusively on tiny ants. In these remote areas, it's often cheaper to abandon an old car rather than pay to tow it hundreds of kilometres to a garage. Malcolm spots what appears to be a good jerry can and decides to help clean up the environment. We're now about 800 kilometres west of Alice Springs 
on what must be the loneliest track in Australia. And a few kilometres down the track is a small community of Kirikara. Now Kirikara must be the most isolated community in Australia. And it's the home of the Pinnaby Aborigines. Now the Pinnaby people have walked in from the desert during the last 20 to 30 years and as recently as five years ago, the last family came in. Now over the years, I've met a number of these Pinnaby people and hopefully when I get into Kirikara, I meet a few of my old friends and about to camp there, do some honey and I'm trying to organise a trip right back through the sand dune country to Lake Mackay and that's really going to be a great trip. On the left, the rarely used track that leads all the way to the Indian Ocean, emerging from the desert north of Port Hedland. The small community of Kirikara was established recently for those Pintabi who have abandoned their nomadic lifestyle. Many of the older people are still struggling to adjust to the dramatic changes affecting their lives. This older generation is fiercely proud of their traditional hunting skills and their cultural identity. The younger generation too have had to cope with the new ways. Even satellite TV has reached this remote part of Australia and daily life in the community is often organised by what's on the box. And most of their food's no longer collected in the bush. Once a fortnight it arrives by truck from Alice Springs. The Pintabi, a very reserved people, take time to accept outsiders. But Malcolm's known throughout the Western Desert and he's soon fulfilling his social obligations. Long distances are covered collecting spear shafts. Making a film a few years ago south of Halls Creek, Malcolm first met his friend Jabinardi. Now a tribal elder, he coordinates day-to-day -day activities. Although rarely needed now for hunting, spears are still symbolically important. They give a man prestige, and they're used during ceremonies and for fighting. Malcolm organises a spear throwing competition, and there's keen rivalry between the men. The spear thrower, or woomera as it's commonly called, gives extra leverage to the cast of the spear. And to hold it all together, a wooden hook on the end of the spear thrower fits into a small depression in the end of the spear. It takes considerable practice to acquire skill and accuracy with this weapon. There are many near misses, but one spear could have killed the roux hitting close to the heart. For countless generations, the desert Aborigines have recorded their religious beliefs in geometric designs carved into stone and wood. Displayed during ceremonies, the patterns depict the dreamtime travels of totemic ancestors. The circles are water holes. The connecting lines represent tracks. Recent worldwide interest in these paintings has encouraged the traditional owners to paint their stories in acrylic on canvas. Top artists can command $2,000 or more for a completed work. Many of the older women with little authority to paint carve desert animals for sale in the tourist shops far away. It takes time and patience to lay down the tight patterns with hot wire. The Pintabi are superb hunters and spend long periods tracking their favourite food, lizards. During the colder months, goannas lie dormant under the sand. When a hole's found, digging sticks probe the soil looking for the burrow. And an experienced eye can detect a slight variation in the soil texture that will reveal a goanna below. Oh, 
Hello. Prey is killed immediately before it has a chance to escape. Controlled burning is an age-old hunting technique. When the spiky spinifex is too thick for easy access, it's fired to expose hidden burrows and drive animals into the open. Because there are now few Aborigines hunting in their tribal lands, the spinifex is rarely burnt. Already environmental changes are evident, and many animal species are classified as endangered. It's likely that in the future, controlled burning of these arid lands will be reintroduced. Firing ensures that the spinifex doesn't dominate other plant species and keeps the ground clear of debris so that the small animals can move freely through the bush. The burrows are easy to see in the smouldering barren earth. The pintabi have always broken the lizard's legs, even when the animal looked dead. Blue tongues too are driven from their cover. Bigger game, like kangaroo, was rarely found in the arid lands, so lizards became a significant part of the diet, and the pintabee have sometimes been called the lizard eaters. In one afternoon, four women caught 28 goannas in three hours. Enough food for many people. and a roaring fire heats the sand for cooking. Dictated by tribal tradition, preparation is always the same. To conserve moisture, the intestines are removed without breaking the skin. As the flames die, each lizard is briefly singed, and when the skin contracts, it seals in the juices. Then the animals are roasted in the hot sand. <laughs> Temperature control looks fairly casual. In Aboriginal society, an animal, regardless of size, is always shared. If there's only one lizard, it's broken into pieces and distributed according to kinship and tribal importance. Today there's plenty, so whole lizards are handed round. Goanna meat, white and juicy, tastes a bit like chicken. At the end of the day, Malcolm's contribution is always the billy of tea. Until recently, a small bush growing on top of the sand ridges was of great importance to the desert dwellers. The pliable bark was used to weave sandals. Even the tough feet of the Aborigines cannot withstand the intense heat radiating from the sand in the summer. So sandals were always worn on long journeys. The women enjoy making the sandals for Malcolm, happily remembering old skills used in the days before contact with Europeans. The staple food of most Aboriginal tribes came from seeds ground on stone and baked into loaves in the coals. The Pintabi still actively forage for many kinds of seeds. Nunamar is gathering small grass seeds collected by ants and stored at the entrance to their nests.
now it's the long, tedious process of separating the seed from the sand. First, the lightest impurities are blown away in the breeze. Although a shaped piece of metal has now replaced the traditional wooden coolerman, winnowing is still an art acquired only after years of practice. It's surprising how much seed's left behind when the rubbish is gone. Until recently, the women spent most of their time collecting and grinding seeds. Their foraging controlled by the availability of water and the many different seed-bearing plants. Originally, the grinding stones were carried out to the water holes in the desert and left to be used whenever the tribe returned to the area. Many different kinds of seeds were used by the Aborigines. Baked in the coals, the traditional loaf is heavy and bitter. So the following morning, Malcolm prepares a damper mix that he finds more palatable. Just getting the, the morning damper finished off. The usual mixture of just self-raising flour and water and a touch of salt. You can put in a bit of uh, milk, powdered milk if you want to. Just mix it up till you've got a dry mix. Now I either just cook it straight in the coals or another good way is to drop it in your pan there. Just nice and cold, the pan, no oil or anything. You don't have to use oil. You don't want to, or you're short of oil, which we are now. Bit of dry flour on the top. And just watch this, we just make a, a good hole in our fire. You notice we've got no flame at all. That'll burn the damper. Dig a hole into the hot sand. We had a good fire going early this morning. Nice and flat. On we go. The hot sand and the coals. There we are, give that about 20 minutes. Top damper. We'll have a... Righto, let's have a look at this damper. It's been in here about half an hour. Here's our frying pan. Looks pretty awful at the moment. But the surprising thing is, once you get it out, all the dust and hot sand and ash comes off it. Just put it on my little plate here because it's a bit hot. How's that? Break it open. Beautiful damper. Look at that. Even got a few raisins in it. That's very easy to make. You can knock them out every morning. For many weeks, Malcolm has nurtured a friendship with Wallum Pitty a gentle, reserved man who was a member of the last family to come into Kirakurra from the desert five years ago. Gradually, Wallampiti and Jabinati begin to take Malcolm out bush. Today, Wallampiti appears more relaxed, more friendly, and as they chew on grevillea flowers, Malcolm feels that Wallampiti has finally accepted him. The men show Malcolm another way of extracting the sweet, nutritious nectar. At last, Malcolm can pack for his journey to Lake Mackay when he gets this final gesture of approval. Lake Mackay is over 100 kilometres long, a huge expanse of dry salt locked between countless sand dunes in this distant part of Australia. The four tribesmen who will accompany Malcolm, Wallampiti and his young brother Wallalar and Jabinadi and Jackamara speak very little English. The men are fascinated by the map of their tribal lands, but the details mean nothing until it's turned upside down, and then they read it perfectly. Wallampiti and Wallalar are still very shy, and even now, after five years at Kirikurra, they sometimes look lost and bewildered. It's likely that in the future they'll be given government support to establish a four-wheel drive track deep into their homeland. The Pintabi are now extremely mobile, hiring small planes to visit distant relatives. 
Chartering the first available plane, Malcolm flies out for a reconnaissance over the country they're about to tackle in the Land Rover. The southwest corner of Lake Mackay, a salt pan that reaches far beyond the horizon. Stretching over thousands of square kilometres is some of the most desolate country in Australia. Between Kirikurra and the dry salt lake lie high ridges that must be laboriously negotiated in four-wheel drive. The following day, the men set off into the wild heart of Australia. 90 kilometres from Kirikurra, Jabinardi tells Malcolm to leave the track and head north into the sand dunes. Here, the trailer must be left behind. The only big animals to be seen are camels. Between 1840 and 1907, thousands of them were transported to Australia, and now their feral descendants roam throughout the arid interior. As their numbers increase, they could cause long-term damage to the fragile environment. This healthy tree has just been snapped off by a browsing camel. Australia is now the only country in the world with herds of wild camels. Jabinardi's immediate concern is for fresh water. At least once a day, he directs Malcolm to wells his family used when he was young. But the water holes have now filled with sand, and each time Jabinardi reluctantly gives up. Malcolm's already worried because Jabinardi had assured him that drinking water would be readily available. Every kilometre or so, there's the arduous job of winching over the dunes. Every day, they travel until sundown. Returning to camp in the morning after taking some photos, Malcolm finds a species of tree that's often infested with witchetty grubs, his favourite bush tucker. Now this looks like a likely tree. Down the bottom here, I've got the chewed up wood, which indicates that there's witchetty grubs down below the surface now. And you'll notice that this tree is just about ready to fall over. If I just give it a couple of shakes, there we are. See, what happens is that the, the grubs get into the get into the trunk here and bore down. So I'm not wrecking a tree because that tree's going to fall over in a few days anyway. Now what I've got to do is get down below the surface here. Just give me a couple of minutes and we'll see if we can get a feed of witchetty grubs. Just got to get right down about a foot. Dig away, get rid of the spin effects because it, it hurts. Oh, right on. Now I'm just about down to the root. I just gotta get rid of some of this rubbish. Get this root out. There we are. I've cut it through. Now, I can see in here at least one rather fat witchetty grub. Just grab a knife. Now, let's see. I'll get my knife open. Get it out so you can all see it. Here we are. Now, there's that dust that I was talking about earlier, the, the dust from the, the chewed up wood from the grub. Just open this up. The wood is very hard out here in the desert, of course. I'm gonna try and get him out. 
In fact, I'll just get this one out here. Here's one here. Uh -huh. There we are. Look at that. Beautiful. Mmm. So sweet. Now let's have a really good look at this grub. You can see nice golden colour. It's got a very small head with large nippers for chewing through the wood. Now, all witchetty grubs have virtually no legs. Just six very immature ones right near the head. But they just virtually pull themselves through the wood. Now, I'll just have a look down here, see if there's any more. Just split this open. There we are. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Here we are. Here we are. Another one. Now, if you don't like witchy grubs raw, you didn't cook them on the coals. And we might have these two for smoko in about half an hour. They take about 30 seconds in the coals, tasting like a mixture of fried bananas and almonds. They're delicious. There are several species of witchetty grub found throughout Australia. Some develop into moths, others into big beetles. Considered a special treat by the Aborigines, they were most valuable as nutritious and easily digested baby food. Witchetty grubs vary in flavour according to their species and the type of wood they feed on. And some do taste better than others. After finishing off the witchetty grubs, the men dig through the sand out on the salt bush plain, sifting out small bulbs. Malcolm's constantly impressed by the Pinterby's ability to find food. Sadly, these people are the last generation to grow up in the desert, and many of their survival skills will die with them. The bulbs look like tiny onions. The skin's rubbed off, and they're eaten raw. The Pinterby never miss an opportunity to forage for anything edible. Jabinardi has heard the faint chirping of a bird, and after cutting into the tree in a couple of places, finds a young budgerigar. He quickly lights a small fire and cooks the meagre meal in the hot sand. Like spears, boomerangs are still an important status symbol for the men. A good carver demands prestige among his peers. And whenever Jabinardi sees a trunk with the right shape, he selects lengths of timber to take back to camp. Found throughout the desert, these big, firm fruits are called bush tomatoes. Jabinardi carefully removes the poisonous black seeds before eating the raw fruit. Bush food should never be tasted without careful precaution. These black seeds can make even an adult violently ill. The flesh is bitter, and Malcolm prefers a quick snack of sweet nectar. Out here, parallel sand dunes dominate the landscape. Without a good vehicle, suitable tyres and a winch, it's impossible to move far. On the top of a particularly high ridge, the men are excited as Jabinadi points out Lake Mackay. The northern end is his country. While Wallampidi explains that his family camped and hunted more to the west. They were only located by the authorities when the nomads came in for water at a new bore south towards Kirikara, near the Alice Springs track. When the bush mob, as they're now affectionately called, were persuaded to settle at Kirikara, the new social pressures took their toll. The oldest brother soon returned to his homeland, and again, roams out there somewhere. Everyone's hoping that they'll find some trace of him on this trip. The men are intrigued by the way their country looks through the powerful telephoto lens. Four hours later, the party enjoys travelling along the flat edge of the lake, 
after so many days confined in a vehicle bouncing over the dunes. Out from the shoreline, Jabinati is anxious to show Malcolm and Brendan something new. Half a metre below the surface, water. Jabinati insists that they try some, and when Malcolm goes along with the joke, there's much merriment among the men. The water underneath is intolerably salty. The perimeter's covered with weird patterns of solified debris. The lake seems to be totally devoid of life. But closer inspection reveals webbed spider holes in the crust. These predators emerge at night to hunt for straying insects. Wallumpity signals. He's found animal tracks. Within the hour, Jack Amara has speared the quarry. A feral cat. He assures Malcolm it's fat and will be delicious. Today, cats are one of the most commonly killed animals in the desert, replacing many of the native species that are now classified as rare and endangered. Fifteen minutes in the coals, and lunch is served. Driving across loose sand littered with dry wood as sharp as nails, punctures are a constant problem, and Bonnie gives Malcolm a helping hand. These days, with wide rims and specialised tyres, anyone planning a journey by four-wheel drive should make sure they know how to change a tyre and carry the necessary equipment to do the job. After a midday camp, they're on their way again, heading for the western side of the lake. This evening, everyone's contented. No more travelling. It's time to relax and enjoy a good feed of freshly made damper and golden syrup. Jabinati assures Malcolm that this is a good place to hunt. Tomorrow, he says, we'll feed on snakes. Jabinati, happy to be on the edge of his country, ties his hair in the traditional manner. The headband of red wool is worn only by initiated men, and in the old days, spun human hair was used. The men track out towards the edge of the lake. Finding little of interest, they cut back to the sand dunes. Jabinati's keen to show Malcolm how the tribesmen hunted in the early days. They move along in single file until tracks are spotted. It's a snake. A woma python. More tracks lead to an abandoned rabbit warren. The men had been looking forward to feasting on rabbits, but in such a dry year, the burrows are empty. The Aborigines recognise the tracks of every animal, and they know that a woma python has gone down this hole. Blue tongues leave a very distinctive track. Any lizards concealed in the impenetrable spin effects are flushed out with fire.
In this country, kangaroo and emu are seen only after exceptionally heavy rains. So lizards have always provided the bulk of essential protein for the people. Food was often scarce, and especially in the dry season, the pentabee moved over vast areas in solitary family groups that might come together only to arrange marriages and perform important ceremonies. In times of drought, it could be years before the pentabee were able to hunt in the far regions of their tribal lands. The snakes are prepared and cooked the same way as the lizards. With the intestines removed, they're baked in the coals. Later in the day, Wallampiti and Wallala head off, hunting together, always on the lookout for signs of their older brother. And in the cool of the evening, they track down a feed of thorny devils. As they head back to camp, contented with their haul, it seems unlikely that they comprehend the worldwide interest created when their family group was located among the sand dunes north from here. Their older brother, now back in the desert, is one of the last Aborigines still leading a nomadic way of life. Europeans settled in Australia over 200 years ago, yet this wide desert of spin effects and red sand is still virtually unknown to the whites. For them, it's too harsh. For the Pintaby, it's paradise. A few days later at sunup, Malcolm's keen to get moving. Their water's precariously low. A scorpion scurries off, and Malcolm's alarmed because it probably moved in under his swag during the night. Although not deadly, it could inflict a painful sting with the vicious barb on its tail. A nocturnal animal, it works steadily to burrow down before the heat of the day. The men head back around the lake. Malcolm's now very worried about their dwindling water supply, but Jabinati's still confident water will be found. It's back into the sand dune country. On the second day, Jabinati assures Malcolm that he found water near here as a young man. This bush, a Melaleuca, prefers wetter conditions, indicating that there should be underground water. With uncanny accuracy, he leads Malcolm straight to the old well. When family groups walked from one water hole to the next, the wells were kept permanently free of sand and debris but the water could still be many metres below the surface. The men soon realise it's a hopeless task. The water's just too far down. Another clue to this ancient well. These discarded grindstones. Malcolm has no option but to head back to Kirakara as soon as possible. At Kirakara, there are long discussions and singing as the men tell the others about their trip away. Then they sing a dreamtime story about winged termites also travelling north to Lake Mackay. The preparations, which take several hours, are more important than the actual dancing. As the decorations are assembled and the body designs daubed on, the singers tell in detail the story of the insect's journey, 
from rock holes to swamps, to soakages, and on to permanent water holes. These stories passed on from one generation to another and endlessly repeated, teach the people where water can be found in the desert. Such information was vital for survival. This kind of ceremony is performed at the edge of the camp and although not sacred, it's an important social occasion that helps to maintain harmony and a strong tribal bond between the men. A backdrop of eucalyptus branches is always erected for the dancers, and Malcolm, now well accepted by all, is expected to help out. The women and children and all the dogs wander in to make up the audience. After several hours of preparation, the performance lasts only a few minutes. To an outsider, the corroboree might look simple, but to the Aborigines, the symbolism and the singing of their dreaming stories is what's really important. These social gatherings are necessary for the Pintabi. They help maintain a culture now under tremendous pressure from a rapidly changing world. And now it's time to leave. So when Malcolm says goodbye and heads west, he's already planning another journey north of Lake Mackay. Over the past 50 years, many of the native animals have disappeared, and Malcolm's hoping a long expedition into the sand dune country might help solve this mystery. Many of the animals may have gone, but the native flowers still bloom in profusion after rain. A thousand kilometres from Alice Springs, a 200 litre drum supports a sign erected by Len Badell, who surveyed the desert roads 30 years ago. So few people travel these tracks that everyone who gets through records their journey. In the last nine months, only six vehicles have registered their arrival. Within two hours, they reach another famous outback track, the Canning Stock Route at Well 33. Travelling the old stock route from well to well is becoming a popular trip for the most adventurous. Bicentennial funding provided new signs for each well. Two days later, and about 2,000 kilometres west of Alice Springs, Malcolm motors out onto the hard, white sands of the 90-mile beach. Even now, as he enjoys the warm waters of the Indian Ocean, he's keen to head north to the Kimberley to begin another adventure. <laughs> 